Wow. Happy Monday. I cannot believe we're back together again. Uh, we've been off for a couple weeks, and boy, what a couple of weeks it's been. First of all, thank you for joining me. I appreciate it. Um, the first week we had summer camp. That would be Memorial Day weekend. Went up to this new camp. It's called Southern Pines Baptist Camp, which is a smaller camp than Triangle Y up in the Mount Lemmon area. If you've been to the Boy Scout camp, it's farther down the road from the Boy Scout camp. And the Girl Scout camp is on that road also. So if you've been to either the Boy Scout camp or the Girl Scout camp, then you've been very, very close to where we went. This is an old camp that was established by uh, the Southern Baptist Church in downtown Tucson. And it's very, very similar. It's actually higher in elevation than the Chiricahua camp that we used to go to years and years ago uh, called Pine Canyon. And that camp, there was a fire that happened near that camp. And so the the Forest Service said, you cannot uh, have a camp in those cabins anymore. So they kicked us out and they didn't renew the lease, which we'd had for a hundred years. And Basically, then the Forest Service took over all the buildings <laughs> and just took them over. <laughs> you know, when you've got all the power in the world, you can do whatever you want to. They didn't pay us. They, I mean, it was just, they just took them over. If you understand how a lease works in the Forest Service, they'll give you the lease on the land, but then you have to build the buildings, the wells, the water system, and all that sort of thing. And And basically, at the end of your lease, if they don't renew it, then all that stuff goes to them. So it's a win-win for the federal government, and it's a lose-lose for people who had spent, you know, millions of dollars building all those facilities. And the same thing is true for the Boy Scout camp, the Girl Scout camp, and this Pine Canyon camp, or the Southern Pines Baptist camp. Anyway, that camp, it's higher up, it's smaller, but it was really, really nice, and we had a great time um, for that camp. It... it um, <sighs> In the last seven years, camp has been canceled five times. Obviously, because of COVID, it was camp. Uh, it was canceled. Then one year, the uh, teachers went on strike, and because they went on strike, and federally they're mandated to have a certain certain number of days of school, they extended school two or three weeks, which extended into camp, and nobody was going to show up at camp, so we camp canceled the camp that year. And then one year, it was uh, some sort of water issue. Oh, what, what? It says I'm on Facebook. Wait, hold on, hold on just, hold on just a second, folks. Sorry, folks. Um, I've got three people watching. Uh, Mrs. Hook says hi. <laughs> oh. Am I in the right location? I don't know. Anyway, um, is it working for you as far as the live stream goes? Can you write a comment and say, yeah, it's working or no, it's not working? Just so I can kind of see. Um, that would be helpful. It may be something on our end <laughs> when I say our end. <laughs> um, yes. Okay. It seems like we're working fine. So it must be a technical error on someone else's end. Any, anyway, um, so we uh, had a great camp. And uh, one of the problems that we've only been able to do it for five of the last seven years is that uh, we, you know, the structure that you build up over time, you know, a camper starts in third grade, then fourth grade, then fifth grade and goes up, you know, that that institutional heritage kind of gets wiped out. So you have to start over from scratch. And um, back in, oh, let me think. Back in 2005, uh, I did a camp with the youth director at Fountain of Life. I was, I was a vicar with Fountain of Life, and we did Pine Canyon Camp. And uh, what happened was when the recession hit, 2007, 2008, like all the churches in Tucson's had to eliminate their youth directors because they were running out of money. People, um, you know, it was just a bad economic time. And so um, there were a couple pastors, me and another pastor, 
uh, I and another pastor got together and said, well, even though we don't have youth directors, let's go ahead and resurrect the camp. So we did. And then over the course of the next 10 years, we built it up. And then, of course, COVID hit and the whole thing got destroyed again. So now we're building it up again. And the, the great thing about camp is that a lot of people find um, a deeper faith at camp. And you talk to a lot of pastors or church workers or teachers or whatever, many, many, many times they'll say it was the summer camp that kind of uh, gave me the motivation to get into this field. And so uh, summer camp is important, and uh, I'm so grateful that we were able to do that. Anyway, so that was the first week. The second week moved my son and his wife. I was part of the moving team to move my son and his wife from Houston, Texas to a small town, and I mean a small town in Minnesota. The town is called uh, Janesville, Minnesota. It's outside of Mankato. And when I when I say a small town, it is a small town, and it, it is a town. I think the population is somewhere around 2,000 in, in the town, but maybe it's 2,300. It's small. It's much smaller than Vail. It's much smaller than any place I've ever lived. Now, although I lived in Seward, Nebraska for a while, but, and it was a small town, but it was a college town, so there was college stuff. And so in this small town, the, uh, my son's wife got a call to this school. It's a Lutheran school, and she accepted that call, and so they moved there, and I helped move them. So the thing about small towns is that, and I've never, other than that brief stint at Seward, I've never really lived in a small town, but... The thing about a small town is it's a very, 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 very tight-knit community. You, everybody knows everybody, and if you've lived in the big city, living in a small town can be a challenge. But the interesting thing is the, the advantage of living in a small town is everybody looks out for each other. Everybody knows each other. The disadvantage of a small town is you may not be able to find a job. Let's say your career is, for example, I'm a civil engineer. There's, there's no way I would be able to be a civil engineer in Janesville, Minnesota. There's just not enough work. My particular degree requires a town of 100,000, 200,000 people or more. And so my, the great thing about living in a big city is you, you, you can specialize and you can do uh, – you know, you can be a specialist in a big town. In a small town, and, and the better you are at your specialty, you know, that's what, what propels you in a large city. The small town, it's all about character. It's all about integrity. It's all about the things that, uh, you know, whether or not you're brilliant at your, at your chosen career or not doesn't matter in a small town because it's all about your integrity and who you are. And so, when you first move to a small town, everybody's looking at you. And so you have to be extremely uh, cautious and understand that you are, um, you know, that everybody's judging you. Should, should they judge you well or judge you not well when you move to a small town? Now, the interesting thing is, is that uh, the, the census came out, the, the most recent census from 2020, people are moving away from the big cities. We we have realized, I guess we have realized that um, that a lot of jobs can be done uh, through the internet and remotely. And the advantage of the big cities are what? You know, you can specialize in your career. Um, there's a lot more arts and entertainment. There's zoos. I mean, all the things that come with the big city that people, the advantage is living in the big city. The disadvantage is you have to deal with traffic and you have to deal with, you know, all the, all the bad things of a big city. But, but now what's happening in a lot of these larger cities across the United States, there's now crime, there's increased crime, there's increased, uh, tensions. The, the advantages of living in the city are not anymore outweighing the disadvantages of living in the city, which is just you know crime and and uh, people are unhappy, so people are 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 moving away from the big cities, and into smaller areas, and a lot of them are working remotely. So places like Janesville, um, you you could live in Janesville, and your wife could be a teacher at a school, and you could be working remotely for a company, you know, anywhere across the world. And so it'll be interesting to see how uh, this whole experiment works for him living in um, in a small town. 
I'm I'm uh, I'm very happy for him because it is uh, it's on a teacher's salary. It's really really challenging to live in a in a large town, especially Houston. Houston is extremely expensive, and right now is an extremely expensive time to live. I think the average price of a house is out of out of reach for ver- for most of the middle class. And so it's just very, very challenging. Um, but in a small town, <laughs> I, I think that it's quite possible, very easy to, um, to you know, to build a life in a in a small town right now in Amer- in America. So I'm just anxious to see how that all. We we had no hiccups whatsoever. Um, we everybody arrived safely when we got there. There was about a dozen people helping move. Uh, out of the truck and into the house, and probably all the people from the school knocked on the door and introduced themselves. You know, within the first couple of days, uh, and then I was able to go. My so they are in a town that's about an hour and a half from where my other daughter lives in Minneapolis. So um, after I helped John and Chelsea, then I went up to see my daughter Lydia. Spent the day with her. We went to the zoo. That was really nice. Got to see my two grandchildren that live in Minneapolis, and they're adorable. And um, so, it, all in all, it was a nice, nice time to go see all those people. And it's nice that uh, that it, it's always nice to have your kids in locations that you think they're going to thrive. And I believe that that uh, my son and his wife will thrive in a small town. I think. Um, the way his personality and who he is, I think he will really enjoy <laughs> living in a small town. So time will tell, of course, to see. But um, it was it was enjoyable meeting all the people, and, uh, and I pray for their continued success and the success of the town and the school and the church and all that sort of thing. All right, so... Um, let's uh let's now that i'm back uh we have one birthday today and uh let me look at that it's claudine williams um that uh, she's wonderful lady and uh, blessings to you happy birthday to you um so let's let's go ahead and get into our study we left off two weeks ago with the death of david David closed his eyes, and he's already appointed Solomon to replace him. There had been rumors that Joab had wanted Adonijah, but David heard about those rumors, talked to Bathsheba, and he declares that Solomon is going to be his heir, and that's where it sits. And David allows Adonijah to live as long as he... Take as long as he doesn't, uh, you know, obey. Uh, uh, as long as he behaves himself, I guess. Basically, as long as he behaves himself, he can live. Because he went and grabbed the horns of the altar and said, "Don't kill me, David." And David says, "You know, as long as you, as long as you behave yourself, you can live." Well, um, now we're beginning into the reign of Solomon. Solomon is now king because David is now dead, and now we can begins seeing how Solomon is going to be as a king. And we pick up in uh, 1 Kings chapter 2, beginning at verse 13. Now Adonijah, the son of Haggith, went to Bathsheba, Solomon's mother. Bathsheba asked him, do you come peaceably? He answered, yes, peacefully. And then he added, I have something to say to you. So remember, he's on, um, how do you say this? He's, uh, hmm... What is it when you're uh, uh, not in parole, but basically, um, you know, you you have to be on your good behavior and go see your parole officer. Um, he's kind of in that kind of situation. Uh, he he's he's um, given his freedom, but he's on a short leash. Let's put it that way. And now he comes to Bathsheba. He has no reason to go to Bathsheba, and so she's nervous. Like, why are you here to see me? And she asked, do you come in peace? Which is a very logical question to ask. I mean, he had tried to take the throne and uh, who knows what his intentions are. So she asks him, do you come peacefully? Very, very logical question. He goes, yes, peacefully. But I have something to say to you. I have something to say to you. Now notice, he doesn't say I have something to ask you. 
He says, I have something to say to you. You may say it, she replied. As you know, he said, the kingdom was mine. All Israel looked to me as their king, but things changed and the kingdom has gone to my brother, for it has come to him from the Lord. Now I have one request to make of you. Do not refuse me. So first it's like I have something to say, and then it's like, well, I have something to request. And now it's a little bit delusions of grandeur to think that all of Israel wanted him to be king. He, I, we, we did talk about this, but one of the characteristics if you want of a leader is somebody who doesn't necessarily crave power because people who crave power make horrible leaders. And Adonijah craved power. And David perhaps saw that or, or God saw that and decided to go with Solomon instead. Solomon did not seem to be as power hungry as his brother Adonijah or as his brother Absalom. If you remember, it was another son that tried to take over from David while David was alive. That was Absalom. Now you've got Adonijah. And he has delusions of grandeur. It, it was maybe a few people, but he did have Joab. If you remember, the king, the, the head of David's armies, Joab, had wanted Adonijah to be king because they were close. and But other than that, it wasn't like this groundswell from Israel to say we wanted Adonijah to be king. He did have a following, but it wasn't all of Israel. And to say all Israel looked to me to be their king is a lie. That's not true. A portion of Israel looked to me to be king. And I was trying to take the throne. Maybe that would have been better to say. If he'd have gone to Bathsheba and said, listen, I wanted to have the throne and some pe- I, I tried to get a little insurrection going, and it didn't work. And now, by God's will, my brother Solomon is king. That would have probably been closer to the truth. But instead, he says, the kingdom was mine, and it was stolen from me, and I can't believe it was stolen, and it was given to my brother from God. All right, God had his hand in that. But now I just have this one request. be All these things that were stripped away from me, and I have a request, don't refuse me. And I just, I see this a lot in politics here in the United States where there's this entitlement that seems to be, I deserve this. Um, uh, I, uh, you know, I've worked, worked so hard from being city councilman to mayor to governor. You know, I deserve to be the next leader of this particular group. And uh, people in the United States don't like that kind of attitude. We really don't like it when people feel like they're entitled to leadership positions. Um, All leadership positions are earned, first of all. And secondly, we're a little bit skeptical of leaders that want the power. We really, really like leaders who... Um, maybe don't, you know, have a little bit of humility. And I, you know, I, I think once you become a, a governor or a senator or house of representative, or even president in the United States, the humility has gone. <laughs> like there is no humility. I have not seen humility in a leader uh, my whole entire life. Maybe there've been a few um, that I could point to, but but most, it seems like it just kind of gets stripped from you. I guess it's because you work so hard. And if you show humility, that's maybe a sign of weakness. And the, the uh, opposing party can, can uh, exploit that weakness for their own political gain. So you never show humility. I've always felt that they, they should be a lot more humble than they come across as. He, he is not, uh, Adonijah is not humble here at all. Um. <laughs> That was my kingdom was taken away from me. Yeah, that's just, um, that's not true. All right. So he says, do not refuse me. I have a request. And she says, you may make the request. So he continues in verse 17. So he continued, please ask King Solomon. He will not refuse you to give me Abishag, the Shunammite, the Shunammite as my wife. So that's the request. Uh, Solomon is Bathsheba's son. He's now king. I just have this one small request. It's just a tiny little request. It doesn't mean anything. In the kingdom and in the world, in the things of this earth, it's just a tiny little thing. 
And he said, what is it? Uh, I just want Abishag, the Shumanite, as my wife. Now, who's Abishag? She's one of David's concubines. If you'll remember when Absalom came and he wanted the throne, he was given advice uh, to take all the concubines to himself. And there is this sense that the con- that when you uh, have a concubine of the king, I mean, the, the concubines stay with the king or the new kings. They do not go out to anybody else. And so while he may say this is a small request, it's actually a huge request. It is a request to, um, to get his foot in the door, right? The camel's nose under the camp, uh, under the tent. It may seem innocuous at first, but it could lead to an insurrection because if he's got uh, this concubine, David's concubine, now he might have a claim to the throne. Now, you know, he was told to be on good behavior and his life would be spared. And now he's just this little tiny thing. And the question that has to come to Solomon at this point is, do you allow this to stand? Do you, do you give into his request and say, ah, oh, it's nothing. It's just one concubine out of 10. It's not a big deal. I'll, maybe this will shut him up and he'll be happy. Or does Solomon say, wait a minute, Th- this could be the beginning of, a, of something really, really bad. What would Joab do? I mean, I can tell you right now, Joab would say, don't do it. This is really, really bad. But Joab is no longer a counsel to Solomon. Joab was, you know, he, he was on... Adonijah's side. So this is something that that Solomon is going to have to really struggle with. And it's right at the beginning of his his presidency, his beginning of his kingship. And these questions are going to come fast and furious, and he's going to have to make some really, really tough, challenging uh, decisions. And this is one of them. And Bathsheba, she could say to him, no, that's not going to happen. I'm not going to make this request. But... For whatever reason, Bathsheba, who I think is a very keen person, this is what she says in verse 18. Very well, Bathsheba replied, I will speak to the king for you. When Bathsheba went to King Solomon to speak to him for Adonijah, the king stood up to meet her, bowed down to her, and sat down on his throne. He had a throne brought for the king's mother, and she sat down at his right hand. So that's interesting. That's another thing. Like, what's now the relationship with your mom when you're king? Do you, do you expect her to bow down to you or do you bow down to her? I mean, th- these, are th- these are the things that you have to decide early on. In the beginning of the United States, the question was, what do we call George Washington? Is, is he going to be king? Is he going to be viceroy? I mean, what, what, what do you call the new leader of the new republic of the United States? And it was Washington that came up with the term president. And it's the only, in all, you know, there was like the first time the term president had been used anywhere in a representative democracy because it had never been used before. But basically, uh, as his role of the leader of the United States, this figurative role, he really is just kind of the president of the organization called the United States. And so um, he didn't want to be king. He didn't want to be duke. He didn't want to be archduke, bishop, or whatever. He, he knew his role um, was different than all the other kingdoms that had been established across the world. And he, apparently, and I'm going by memory here, but I'm pretty sure it was Washington that said, We're, I'm going to go by president. And he was the first, so he could decide how he wanted to call himself. And uh, he was very, very keen to make sure that that it would be um, just a limited position in sharing power with the other two branches of government, and that if he started calling himself king, then would his children? Of course, Washington had no children. Would he? Would they be heir apparent to the throne? Uh, would Would that happen? Um, mm, yeah. So the question that's going to happen next is how's King Solomon going to take this? But unfortunately we are out of time and it's time to move on. It's, uh, it's getting late. So, um, I think we'll stop the story here and then we'll pick it up tomorrow. 
So let's close in prayer. Gracious God, thanks for this beautiful day, and I pray that you keep us safe. Thanks for uh, for keeping me safe in all the travels. And until we meet again, keep us in your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So uh, a couple housekeeping things. First of all, uh, I have no plans until my grandchild is born sometime, and then we might have to make a quick trip to Chicago. We'll see how that goes um, to, to see grandchild number six of um, who knows how many grandchildren there are going to be in that, <laughs> in this little world. <laughs> I think now that some people are living in Janesville, the odds of more grandchildren went up because <laughs> the cost of living in Janesville is a lot less. All right. Hey, thanks all of you for, uh, for joining me online. I appreciate it. And I pray uh, that you have a great day. Um, so uh, until we meet again, we will... Let me move my mouse over here. We will see you later. Take care. Bye.